Father, thanks for the privilege we have to meet together in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the reminder that we have of, of what you have done and what you are doing in our lives. That your, your, your plans are still to prosper. We sang it even through the difficulties of life. It isn't based upon our relationship with you and, and what we experience with you. It isn't based on the externals of life. And so thank you for that truth. And Father, I pray now for some of these situations that we've mentioned, others that we that are on our minds as well. We do think of Dale and we pray for, for his continued uh, journey, uh, for health, for him. Thank you for some progress that's being made. Uh, but Lord, we realize there are some other pretty serious implications. Lord, I pray for... Uh, Jim Bergunier is, uh, begins a new part of the journey and, and uh, from what we've heard just really a, a great celebration of life uh, that Pam had, had put together, his wife had put together, uh, of celebrating Christ who is her only hope. And so, Lord, uh, the gospel was shared. We pray for those who heard it. And we are grateful that you give to us hope. And Lord, I pray now that as we open up the scriptures, the Bible that you've given to us to help us in these days, uh, that we would be encouraged to walk with you. That we will go from here understanding even a little more clearly uh, what you have for us, how we can live profitably, how we can live wisely uh, in this time frame. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we began our journey through uh, the book of a Bible that instructs us about uh, how to experience joy in our lives, uh, and experience joy in this, this earthly journey. I thought it would be helpful for us as we look around at our particular setting and situation that we find ourselves, uh, maybe individually, maybe uh, as a family, and certainly as a country and a nation and around the world. And so we are reminded of the fact that we live in unprecedented times. So the question is asked, is it possible for us to experience joy? Is it possible for us to experience joy? The book that we are selecting to spend some time with is a book or a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. It's called Philippians. And really the main theme of the book is how to have joy. Uh, the joy as we looked last week as we started into this in the first eight verses is the fact that this joy that God gives to us is a joy that's based on relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not based on the things around us that we see out there. That it is possible for us certainly uh, to have happiness. Even before we knew Christ, it's possible for us to have happiness <coughs> because of God's common grace. Good things happen, promotions happen, good relationships happen, and so we have this happiness. But joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is based on, on Christ in spite of some of the circumstances and trials and difficulties that we experience through life. And Paul, as he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, and also by extension to you and me today, he's giving to us principles by which we can apply to our lives to also experience joy. We looked last week and, and we noticed that this, this joy that comes in a relationship with Christ, uh, it's God's work that begins the process of a good work of a relationship with Jesus. We would use the term salvation. It's a good Bible term that we're saved into a relationship with Christ. And that it comes as a result. It comes as a result of God's work. And we saw that in verse 6 of uh, chapter 1 of the book of Philippians. If you want to open a Bible and follow along with us, I encourage you to do that. If you want to use a few Bibles, page 1174 in which uh, we see that Paul emphasizes that this work of salvation, this good work that God does, begins, God's the one who starts it and God's the one who finishes it. You see it in verse 6, for it, is, for it is he who has begun a good work in you, who will bring it to completion, who will bring it to perfection, who will bring it to conclusion. And so you say, well, who's the he? You go back to verse 3 and says it's God who begun this good work and it's God who will see it to conclusion. So if you mark your Bibles, you can circle the God in verse 3 and, and, and circle uh, begun a good work in verse 6 and circle bring it to conclusion and draw lines from God to the beginning and God to the end that it's God's work. Now don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean that you and I don't have a responsibility. God draws us. God calls us. But God also gives to us the opportunity to respond to say, yes, I, I want to accept the invitation to become part of your family, or we just choose to go on living as we have, which is a rejection. So we have a part in that as well. 
So that's a piece that we see, that this salvation piece begins with the work of God. But that isn't the end of the story. That's merely, that's merely the beginning. That what God wants to do is He begins this good work in us. He wants us to grow into Christian maturity. The Bible uses the term of being like a baby when we're first saved. So there's, we're a spiritual infant. But man, if we're still a spiritual infant in 20 years of spiritual life, we've got a problem. And so there's to be growth in our lives. And, and, and again, God's at work in it, but we have responsibilities. And so we're going to look at just three verses together this morning in which there is a spiritual discipline that is an absolute necessity for us to grow in our spiritual lives. There's a spiritual exercise that you and I must be involved in in order for us to have spiritual growth. And Paul encourages the church at Philippi and he encourages us today in regards to this. What I'm referring to, and Paul makes reference to it, is a term we use called prayer. Now, I must confess, too often I'm afraid we think of this business as prayer as something that's sort of tacked on when, well, I can't do anything else, so I guess I'll pray. Well, Paul is telling us that in order for spiritual growth and maturity to happen in our lives, prayer has got to be part of that. In order for spiritual growth to happen in the lives of your kids, you need to be praying about that. They need to be praying about that. If your spiritual growth is to happen in, in your extended family, in your, among your friends, we are to pray for spiritual growth, certainly for our lives, but also for theirs, as we'll see here. And we're going to see that this, this prayer is focused prayer. Too often we kind of give it a shortness when we say, well, you know, uh, Lord, bless the missionaries. And uh, bless Aunt Susie, she's got a bunion on her foot. And bless a brother, whoever, whatever, he's got this little problem. And I'm not suggesting we can't pray for physical ills. But the most important prayer that you and I can pray for somebody else has to deal with their spiritual growth, with our spiritual growth, and with their spiritual growth. So it needs to be focused prayer. If we look at our lives and say, you know, I'm not growing as I ought to be growing, maybe it's because I am not praying like I ought to be praying. And we look around us and we say, you know, our, our children are making the growth that we would love to see. Maybe it's because we're not really praying for some specific things in their lives. And so let's look together in um, this particular passage in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. A necessity for spiritual growth. And of course we understand spiritual growth brings joy. If, if we see growth in our lives, that's, that's a reason for thanking God for what He's doing. If we see growth in the lives of our family, spiritual growth in the life of our family, that's a reason for rejoicing. If we, we see spiritual growth in the lives of others around us who are followers of Jesus, that's a cause for rejoicing. It really breaks down into two uh, emphasis here this morning. The first, Paul gives to us a specific prayer, the, the reminder of specific prayer in verse 9 and what we should focus upon, and then in verses 10 and 11, three characteristics or three results uh, of focused prayer. I struggle with the proper terminology. I, I don't like to use three things, but there are three things that we'll get in verses, verses 10 and 11. So let's look together in verse 9 where Paul speaks about this uh, specific prayer, and he says this in verse 9. He says, and, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment. Paul says, I continue to pray. Notice in verse, verse 9, I, I am praying. It's a present tense. I'm continuing to do this. If you recall, as we were introduced last uh, week together, that Paul is praying for the church of Philippi. And Paul, when he talks about this joy... It isn't, again, dependent upon outward circumstances. Paul's in prison when he's writing this, probably in Rome. He's had some difficult times in his life. He's been in prison before. For spent two years there, uncharged, and nothing was brought against him. He was in shipwreck. He, he's not writing from some very conducive, nice uh, place to write from. And this is one of the, Philippians is one of the prison official, epistles, one of the prison letters. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are prison letters that Paul writes from prison. And so he's challenging, and he's writing to the Philippian church, probably hasn't had any interaction with them for at least 10 years. And he says, you know, I'm continuing to pray for you. It wasn't I prayed for you five years ago. I prayed for you when I was in your city. He said, I continue to pray for you 
uh, in, in where you are and your needs. So I am praying. I am praying for what? I'm praying that the love, notice that, I pray that your love may abound still more and more, that your love may continue to grow. Now before we look at that piece in a moment, we ask the question, those of you who are in grammar, what's the object of his love? You know, he says, I want your love to grow. Love for who? Or love for what? There isn't any object given. So is he saying, I want your love for God to grow? I think absolutely so. We'll see that in the text. I want your love for your neighbors to grow. I think absolutely that, that's in the text. I want your love to grow for your Christian brothers and sisters. Yes. I want your love to grow. Oh, this hurts. For your enemies. But didn't Jesus say, you've always heard it said, treat those that treat you well, and those who hurt you, hurt them badly. But I say to you, love your enemies. Like, Why? So, we are being instructed here. Maybe you, when I mention the word enemy, okay, I can use a different term. Someone who really pushes your buttons. And, and, and maybe somebody comes to your mind right now. Guess what? There would be an object of your prayer that God's love would flow through you. Oh. But that's what I'm saying. There's, there's no object. So it's, it's open to everything and everyone, right? He isn't saying, just love God. And so he says, I am praying, I am praying that your love would continue to grow, that it would abound, that it would increase. Again, it's a present tense. So, so that our love, what it was last year, is different from what it is to, today. That our love, your love, my love, in these areas would have grown deeper. And next year would even be more so, and much more than what they were five years ago. Is our love growing? And I pray, he says, that, God, that this love will grow. Remember, God, that Jesus broke down the Ten Commandments into two. The greatest commandment is your love to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and the order is important. Because if I am not loving God, and I am not experiencing God's love in me, there is absolutely no way that I'm going to love my neighbor as I ought to. It's impossible. So this is predicated on the fact that my love for God is growing deeper. And if my love for God is not deeper this year than it was last year, then my love for other people around me is not going to be deeper than it was last year. Then my love for my spouse or your love for your spouse will not be deeper if, if your love for God hasn't grown. Your love for kids will not be deeper if your love for God hasn't grown. Because it's God's love that comes through us. This isn't some sort of love that we kind of conjure up and make believe and pretend. And I, you know, you did something really nice for me, so I really feel loving to you. That's not what love is. In fact, uh, and then Paul elsewhere writes and he says, you know, the love of God is is poured out into our lives. It, it's super abundantly poured out into our lives so that it overflows and splashes out on the people around us. That's what he's talking about. And if I don't have love splashing out on the people around me, it's because I'm not receiving God's love as I ought to receive, and it's not God's fault. So how do I grow deeper in God's love? Well, it's, it's reading the scriptures in which he tells us about himself and what his, his love looks like and how it acts and how it interacts with people. And then the Holy Spirit has this me to come along and say, Hey, Dan, you know, you just read about this. So how you doing? So good. That person that pushes your buttons, how are you doing with that? Okay, I need some work. I need to do what God has said. And so that's why Paul says this is a very focused prayer. It's active prayer. Can you imagine how this trans would transform our homes? Maybe it is. Maybe you're seeing it happen in your home because your love for... For God is deepening, and as a result of that, it is flowing out into your home. Makes a big difference. Your love for God is growing deeper, and as a result of that, it's splashing out on your kids. Your love for God is deepening, and so it's splashing out on your co-workers. And even the one that pushes your buttons. 
But notice, this isn't a wishy-washy, mushy kind of love. You know? So what is love? What's it look like? Well, I don't know. Well, it's identified for us. He says there in verse 9, I want it to be love that's based on true knowledge. It's based on full knowledge. What's best, what's best in my life and what's best for those around me? What's, what's the best way that I can impact my spouse, my husband, my wife for, for God? Even when, even when you don't feel like it. Because God loved us when he really shouldn't have. And so it's based on full knowledge. And secondly, it's, it, it's based on real discernment. What's discernment? Being able to separate the important from the unimportant. So it, it's a love that's really focused. It flows out through us, into us, so that it can flow out on other people. But it's based on true knowledge of who God is and what He's done and, and that relation. But it's also based on discernment to separate the important from the unimportant. So Paul is instructing us here that if I am to grow in spiritual growth, if, I, if that's going to happen in my life, I need to exercise the spiritual discipline of focused prayer. If those around me, and notice Paul is praying for the church in Philippi. He's praying for others. He undoubtedly is praying this for himself, but he's praying it for others around him. So this is a, a great prayer to pray for other people. Family members, friends, etc. And so in verses 10 and 11, <clears throat> kind of struggle with what to call these three aspects, as you probably noticed at the outset. Are they, are they three characteristics of love? Well, we could pray for these, but these are things that ought to be happening, that we ought to be able to see. You ought to be able to see these things in my life, in your life, in the life of those around you who are growing. These are, these are those three characteristics, or these are three results, but they're a process, so I don't mean it to be, okay, now I have now achieved, so it's a result. And so we, we come in verses 10 and 11, and, and we read this. Paul says, I am, let, me, let me just back up for a moment, verse 9. For God, excuse me, that's verse 8. Verse 9 is what I want. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment so that. And church family, when you hear that phrase, so that, what is it? What kind of clause? Purpose clause. It's the reason Paul is praying. That love is not something, again, that's wishy-washy, mushy, that you can't see evidence of it around you. That if you really love your spouse, if you love your husband and pull out the wife, if I love my wife, then these are three characteristics that are going to be part of that. A purpose clause, you understand, if I tell you I'm going to go to the grocery store in order to buy a gallon of milk. So I'm going to the store on a purpose, and that is to buy a gallon of milk. Paul here is saying the reason I'm praying that God's love would be in you and would grow in you and continue to grow in you is because there are three things... I want to that God's love will accomplish in your life. And so he says the first one, the first result, uh, characteristic, this is the first evidence. Again, you feel, figure out how to, what to call it. But he says this, that we would make the best possible choices. That we would make the best possible choices. That's in the first part of verse 10. I pray this so that you may approve the things that are excellent. The things that are excellent. Approve means put it to the test. That we are to take these choices that are in front of us and we are to put them to the test. It's a word that was used of determining whether or not a, a coin was, uh, was legitimate or whether it was a counterfeit. Um, some of you who work in, in, in retail or whatever, you, you know, you get to the, the store, you turn in a $20 bill, and they take a pen and they run it across because they want to see, make sure it's legit. They're putting it to the test. And so here what we read is that, that, that uh, Paul says that, that we need to put, with God's love flowing through us, we need to put things to a test to determine whether or not they're excellent. This is not putting something to the test to determine whether it's sinful or good. 
That's fairly easy to determine. What Paul is saying is we need to put it to the test to determine what is good, better, and best. You see, because a lot of times the good can prevent us from having the best, or the better can prevent us from having the best or the most excellent. And it's but it's a whole lot easier for, to go for the good and the better, isn't it? And so Paul says, I'm praying that God's love flowing through you would help you to be able to discern what is excellent in your choices. So that for those of you who are parents, and you have younger children, maybe they're not yet married, so that you are praying for them specifically. God, help them to be able to determine what is the best choice of a mate for them, a spouse for them for life. It's the second most important decision they'll make. First one is what are they going to do with Jesus? Second one is who am I going to commit my life to the, for the rest of life's journey? And so you're asking and you're praying on behalf of your kids. You're praying also on your behalf because you face choices, I face choices each day. And we want God's very best in regards to that. But the problem is it makes us think, doesn't it? <laughs> it means we just, well, I just go with the flow. You know, I've done that and ended up the wrong street. Someone has suggested that uh, it's estimated that only 5% of people think. 15% of people think they think. And 85% of people would rather die than think. So what this is telling us is that we have this responsibility to think through the decisions and the choices that God brings in front of us. Maybe you've heard the little analogy of the pilot who's uh, flying his airplane and all the avionics go out of the airplane. And so he gets on the intercom and he says to folks, look, we've lost all the avionics up here, but we've got a tremendous tailwind. So we don't know where we're going, but we're going really fast. We're making good progress. But we don't want that to be part of our life. Where we're just driven by stuff around us, by the pressure around us, by the culture around us, by the influences of the media around us. If this isn't more applicable today than ever before, I don't know what is. I need this. You need this. So the first reason we pray or the first result of why we pray or what we ought to see happen while we pray. And, and we can pray for this, by the way. God, help me to use your love to make the very best decisions in this situation that I can. Sometimes, you know, we have to make a decision. And, and I mean, sometimes the decisions are hard, aren't they? Am I enabling this person? Or am I helping this person? Tough decisions. Secondly, we find that uh, not only are we to make the best possible choices, God wants us to be the best people possible. We see that in verse 10, last part of verse 10. So that you might be, in order that you might be sincere and blameless until the day of Jesus. In order to be sincere or pure, the word used there is the idea of being evaluated or by the sun or judged by the sun. I don't know if you've ever uh, probably had washed something and thought you had it all nice and clean. You took it outside and stuck it in the sun and said, oops, no, not so much. It was evaluated by the sun. The sun looks at, you know, the sun reflects on it. You get to see it in, in a bright light. You determine whether or not it's good. And that's what this is referring to. That we are to be people who are sincere without hypocrisy. So that I am the same kind of person in church when I'm with you as I am out in the business world or on the sports field. That there's not a hypocrisy that comes or same kind of person in my home. In order that we would be sincere, in order that we would be blameless, the word there is an interesting word. It has the idea of, of, of tripping someone up. It's a little, it doesn't mean that we become perfect. But it means that we live our lives in such a way that we don't trip up other people. So that at work, you know, somebody say, hey, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with you, but there's something different about you. What is it? That you're being blameless. You're leading them to Christ. We're emphasizing who Jesus is. And other times we can trip up people and say, man, uh, he's a follower of Jesus. I don't want any of that. So we're called to be blameless. 
some of you think, well, you know, there, there are, are some people that are always upset about something. I realize that. They'll trip over everything. They love to complain. In fact, some of the suggested when they get to heaven, they're going to be miserable because there's nothing to complain about. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand there's some people that, that can always point, yeah, you, you did, you did. And that's not what he's talking about. So we are watching our lives so that we live in such a way that that we honor Christ, in fact, it says in, in, in preparation for the day of Christ until the day of Jesus. And that's the culmination and that's the finish. So we make the here, first of all, to, to have the love of Christ flowing in us so that we make the best possible choices. Secondly, so that we might be the best people possible. And then thirdly, that we might be fruitful people with good works. That's verse 11. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes from Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So it, it, it's a product of really of Christ, and it's both. You know, I can't sit in my easy chair and say, okay, fill me with good fruit. I mean, God, Christ is at work in us, but we have that responsibility as well. Peter writes and he says, you know, God has given to us everything that you and I need for life and godliness. But that you supply, Peter says, and he lists he lists seven things that we have a responsibility to apply to our lives as we live it out before God. So God calls us and He saves us to be fruitful people. To accomplish His will. That's the reason when you trust Christ or when I trust in Christ, God doesn't say, okay, come on back to heaven. He's got work for you and for me to do that, that we are called to be fruitful people. You remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of works, not of you, lest someone would boast. And that's what we would do. Look at me, look what I've done. So it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourself, not of works, lest you boast. And then in verse 10, but we are Christ's workmanship. The word is poem, creative activity. We are Christ's workmanship, created for good works. But then here's a little bit of a phrase that gets your attention. Prepared beforehand. So if Jesus saves us, God saves us, calls us into his family so that we can be about doing good things for God on, on earth until he takes us home. So he saved us for the purpose of doing good works, which he has prepared beforehand, which means that God has a to-do list on his refrigerator. Okay, he doesn't have a But God has good works. He has things for you to accomplish. I don't care what your age is. <clears throat> Middle school, high school, young adult, college age, middle, and older. That God has left us here for a reason. It's so that we would be producing good works. And this is certainly something that our culture needs to see today. Is the good works of Christ flowing through us. This fruit comes from Jesus. This isn't self-generated. And notice what the result is. Who gets the glory? To the glory and praise of our God. To the glory and praise of our God. So that when individuals look at us and they observe us, how we interact in our world and at work and among other people, and they say, man, there's something different about them. They may not be able to put their finger or their thumb on it, but it's a love of God that is flowing through us that is accomplishing this. Who gets the glory and the praise? Not us. Oh, look, he's such a nice guy. He's such a nice gal. That's amazing what God can do, because I know him. God is at work, and so God gets the glory, and God gets the praise. The noble deeds point back to God, who's the source. And so we've come almost full circle, haven't we? That the love of God is to flow out into our lives. And as it does so, it splashes out on those around us. And as a result of that, we pray this for ourselves. And we pray this for our spouse. And we pray this for our kids. And we pray this for other believers in Jesus. That they would be able to make the best possible choices. That, they, that we might be the best people possible. And then we might bear fruit in the name of Jesus so that God gets the glory and God gets, God gets the praise. And friends, when that happens, that's joyful. 
you know, you're, you're, you're instructing your children, right? And the things of God, you need to teach them these things. And, and you see them begin to have that happen in their life. The fruit begins to happen in their life. And that becomes an experience of joy. I can tell you that as a parent. Or you begin to see these things take over in your home. It becomes a joyful experience. And instead of saying, God, fix my wife. Maybe what I need to be praying more, okay, maybe it's you, you know, I need to be praying more. You know, God fix Dan. May he grow in the love of God so that the love of God splashes out more on his life in the home and in the family. When that happens, we make the best possible choices. We might be the best possible people. And they have the good fruit that God gives to us, not self-generated. Not self-generated. So what Paul tells us here is the necessity for spiritual growth is focused prayer. Maybe there's someone here this morning who has not yet begun a journey of becoming part of God's family. God extends it to you, and He invites you to become part of the family, and He might be doing the work in your life, drawing you toward that, and it's a matter of saying, Yes, I need Jesus. I trust Jesus. He paid for my sins and my failures. I'm invited in. It's nothing that I do. And I'm saying yes to what God is offering to me through the person of Christ. And that begins this journey of the Christian walk. But once that journey starts, it's not the beginning. It's just the beginning. I'm reminded of a story quite a few years ago. An individual by the name of Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, it was right after this, the First World War. And he'd taken some of his... Uh, friends with him to visit Paris, okay, Paris, and, uh, and while, they, while they're there, they're you know, showing them all the different sites and stuff that's there, the monuments, the exhibits, and all of that, and, and he took them back to the hotel room, and the thing that grabbed their attention the most was the fact that there in the hotel room, in the bathroom, you had these two gadgets at the bathtub that you would turn, and water would come out. Lawrence of Arabia, you, do, uh, you know, he was in the desert. Okay, so for these individuals, this, this, this is something really cool. We need to be able to take this back to the desert. So as they were getting ready to pack up and leave, Lawrence of Arabia is looking for his friends, and they're in the bathroom trying to figure out how to disconnect these two devices so they could take them back to the desert and have water. <laughs> And he has to explain to them, no, there's a reservoir out there. Water comes from the Alps and all of that. It comes down through that. There's a reservoir and it all flows through that. It's not, those are just this faucets. And that's really what we are. We're just the means of communicating God's love to a world that desperately needs to do it. It isn't self-generated. And so when someone's asked, you know, how can you love a person like that? And it's been me, you know, God's love is flowing through me. It's, it's God is at work. How can you have a home that, that has that joy and that, that confidence and that love? And it's because God's love is flow, flowing through us into our own. So a necessity for spiritual growth is focused prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving to us truth and a way and a means by which something very applicable for each of us in our lives. But the love of Christ, your love flows down into us so that it splashes out on people around us, fills us, and as a result of that, impacts those around us. And, as a, and so we, we make the best possible decisions because we are allowing you to help us discern those things. This is a love that is a discerning kind of love. It's a true kind of love. It's a faithful kind of love. It's a love that uh, make, helps us to be the best people possible as we grow and as we learn about you. It's the kind of love that produces godly fruit in our lives. And it's not us, we're just the means to communicate that. But it comes from the reservoir of God's love. Father, and we live in a time and a culture that desperately needs to see this in reality. We're grateful for this nation. We're grateful for those who paid the price, ultimate price, to give us the freedom to assemble and to meet and to talk about the things that are most important. But Father, really, 
what our nation needs to see of followers of Jesus walking close with him, allowing his love, your love, to pour out on individuals around us. Sometimes we would probably call them enemies. But this would continue to revolutionize our homes, our relationships. So Father, we want to practice what we want to do with you might get the great the praise, the honor, and the glory. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Let's go.